Loving Lord, we thank Thee for our Savior, the Lord Jesus, and for Thy Holy Word, the Bible, and for the privilege which Thou dost afford us of coming together to examine the message which we believe Thou hast given to us. Lord, we would not place a wrong interpretation upon any passage deliberately, and we would not try to palm off our preconceived ideas and notions upon any audience or individual, but we do want and need the direction of the Holy Spirit, both in the interpretation and the application of the truth. And we do trust that there will be some blessing for us all today. Help us now as we look into thy word, for we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now, Daniel chapter 7 commences what I would call the second half of the book. It contains a series of visions that Daniel himself saw. Up to this point, Daniel had not been seeing the dreams or the visions. He's been interpreting the dreams and visions of others. But this begins a series, this chapter commences a series of visions that Daniel himself saw and all of the visions that he received, are interpreted. Now, the first vision, or the first dream that Daniel received himself, is in chapter 7, and it's about four beasts. I want to read some verses. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. That phrase, the sum of the matters, is more literally rendered the essential content of the matters. He didn't give out every detail, but the essential contents of the things that he wrote. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse or different, one from another. The first was like a lion. Verse 5, Behold another beast, a second like to a bear. Third, verse 6, After this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard. And finally, in verse 7, After this I saw in the night visions, and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly. It had great iron teeth, It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now, at this point, I want to submit to you or suggest to you a principle of Bible study. We call this the principle of parallelism. The principle of parallelism simply means this that there is a similarity of construction and meaning in two Bible passages. The principle of parallelism. Similarity of construction and meaning in two Bible passages. Now, at once you can see the similarity between chapter 2 and chapter 7. In chapter 2, there is an image made up of four metals. In chapter 7, there are four beasts. In chapter 2, the four metals represented four kingdoms. Spelled out, you couldn't miss it. The word is used in chapter 2 as we pointed that out. In chapter 7, what do these four beasts represent? Let the Bible interpret the Bible. There's nothing fantastic or uh, imaginative here. Verse 17, verse 17. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings. Now, this is not Lehman Strauss's interpretation. This is what the Bible says. You see the parallelism between chapter 2 and chapter 7. In other words, the four beasts in chapter 7 represent the same as the four metals in chapter 2. They are kings. They are nations, world powers. The first one was Babylon. The second was the Medo-Persian Empire. The third was the Grecian Empire. And the fourth 
was the Roman Empire. Now, there is another parallel that I want you to note. Will you observe chapter 2 of the book of Daniel, where you have the great image with the four metals, and observe verse 42. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. Now, I must use a word here that is not in Scripture and speak of the implied ten toes. Actually, Daniel 2 does not say that the image had ten toes, but a baby born with four or six toes on one foot, or more or less, would be an abnormal child, at least the foot would be abnormal. Every normal foot has five toes on each foot, so they are the implied ten toes. We are assuming that in the statue or in the image, it was a normal situation. So these are the implied ten toes. Now, if you will turn to the seventh chapter once again, you will notice that out of the fourth beast there are ten horns. I'll read the entire verse. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. The ten toes, or the implied ten toes, in the image in chapter 2, and the ten horns in chapter 7, mean the same thing. You have four metals, four beasts, representing four nations, or four kingdoms. You have ten toes, you have ten horns. The number ten means exactly the same thing as we shall see just a little later. Turn to Revelation chapter 13. Put a marker in Daniel. We're coming back to it. Revelation chapter 13. When you found the 13th chapter, I want to read beginning with verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns. Crowns speak of kingdoms. The number ten in this verse will interpret the ten toes and the ten horns in Daniel 2 and 7. Turn to Revelation chapter 17 and observe verse 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet. As yet, when John wrote the book of the Revelation, they had not risen as yet. Now, look up from your Bibles while I make a point. You will notice that the ten toes appear at the bottom of the image. That image depicted what class? The times of the Gentiles. That period of time beginning with the reign of Nebuchadnezzar in 606 B.C. and continuing to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. For the fifth kingdom in chapter 2 is the kingdom of the Son of God. Now observe Daniel chapter 7 once again. After the fourth kingdom, after the fourth beast, and verse 17 says they represent kings and kingdoms. This is what it means. This is what the Bible says it means. After the fourth one, verse 9, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit. Verse 13, And I saw in the night visions, and behold, One, like the Son of Man, came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him, there was given him, dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not pass be destroyed. Now, what have you seen? Well, you've seen four metals representing four kingdoms. The fifth kingdom was the stone cut out without hand that came from heaven. In chapter 7, there are four beasts. What do they represent? Verse 17, four kingdoms, the same four. After the fifth comes the Son of God to establish his kingdom in the earth. The point to be made right here is that there never will be a nation to rule the world again before the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Daniel 7, 
Daniel 2 are teaching the same thing. Why the seeming? Rep- it is a repetition in a sense. But why do we have this repetition? Well, you will notice that the nations are represented differently. In chapter 2, they are seen from the human point of view. You see the prowess of man. You see the head of gold, the breast and arms of silver, the belly and thighs of bronze, and the feet of iron. You will remember what Nebuchadnezzar said. This is the great Babylon which I have built. We see the kingdoms of the world, the times of the Gentiles, as man looks upon it, as having made great progress and great strides. Nebuchadnezzar tried to prove this, as we shall see in a moment in chapter 3. This is what man thinks of himself. But when God presents the kingdoms of the world, the great nations of the world, he sees them as beast-like in character. Now, don't get upset over that. I think you can have that proved to you in just a moment. Let's consider the prowess and progress of man during the years. Think of the remarkable scientific advance that we have made. We fly in the air. We travel at breakneck speed in automobiles. We go to the moon. We have all kinds of scientific discoveries. We've harnessed the atom. We've discovered it. We've developed it. We've packed it into HT bombs. But how do we use all of this power that we have? We use it in destruction to kill one another, you see? Now, man doesn't see this. He thinks he's getting better and better. He brags on his great achievement. He discovers the atom. He packs it into a thimble, and he says, look what I did. And then he drops one on some nation, you see. They call that progress. We, we learn to fly in the air. But we use our airplanes to drop bombs on people. And we say, look at the progress we have made. We invent machines to, to go underwater, submarines. But what do we use them for? We use them for military activity. All this other progress made, but they're used for military activity. So you see, man is progressing. But to what end? To self-destruction. He doesn't see himself as beast-like the way God predicts him. Chapter 7, great world powers are seen from the divine side, not the human side, and they are beast-like in nature. Now you can see why Daniel got his vision. Now what are we to learn up to this point? By the four metals and the four beasts. Oh, by the way, uh, you will see another similarity. You will remember in the image in chapter 2, It began with a head of gold. And then Daniel, in interpreting the king's dream, made it very clear that the second metal would be inferior. You remember that? Inferior. Now, the lion is the king of the forest, you see. So with each succeeding beast, there is an inferiority. So that the world is not getting better, it is deteriorating. It's improving scientifically, deteriorating morally and spiritually. You see, we have less respect for one another than we ever had. Life is cheap. You can kill a man today. People think nothing of it. We had a man here two weeks ago who was employed in the YMCA in Atlantic City. A man, or in Philadelphia, forgive me, in Philadelphia. A man came down from his room, had registered there. He walked up to the desk and had a gun in his hand. And the the man at the desk, the Christian brother who was here for his vacation, he said to the man, (laughs) with a smile, he didn't think it was for real, he said, you're not going to shoot me, are you? And with that, the man unloaded the revolver and shot him five times. He still has one of the bullets in his stomach. He showed me the marks where they had extracted the other bullets. Now, they took the man in for psychiatric examination and treatment. And they concluded that he was not a criminal, so they set him free. You see, he's on the streets today in Philadelphia, probably carrying a loaded gun. He might well be uh, someone who's killed someone else and they haven't found the murder yet. The point I'm making is life is cheap. Not too many years ago, that condition could not have existed. You wouldn't have gotten away with that. What am I trying to say? Simply this, that we have the image on its head. We have man improving spiritually and morally. 
But the image, the dream of the beasts, and the dream of the image in chapter 2 prove conclusively that man, while he is improving in many areas, is degenerating spiritually and morally. This is the purpose of these two visions, to show that there's a time set apart by God called the times of the Gentiles, Luke 21, 24. And then at the end of Gentile world rule, and one of the indications will be when Jerusalem is now in the hands of the, of the people who own it, to whom God gave it, the Israelites, then the Lord Jesus Christ will come back again. He will set up his kingdom in the earth. Now, Nebuchadnezzar didn't believe this. Daniel gave him the interpretation, but he had a little idea of his own. So turn back now to the third chapter. Chapters 2 and 7 should really be studied together. You do not study the book of Daniel uh, the way it is written in the order that the chapters are arranged to get it chronologically. You have to study it through and find out that chapters are not arranged chronologically. Now I want you to go back to chapter 3. Perhaps a very brief review will help us at this point. When Nebuchadnezzar dreamed his dream of the great image, and Daniel interpreted it for him, he said unto him in verse 36 of chapter 2, This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he, God, given into thine hand, and hath made thee, Nebuchadnezzar, ruler over them all. Now mark the next statement, thou art this head of gold. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon, is represented by the head of gold and by the first beast in chapter 7. Thou art this head of gold. But he said, verse 39, After thee shall arise another kingdom, another kingdom. Now, Nebuchadnezzar got to thinking on this. He said, Now, I'm top man on the totem pole. We are the nation that has the world, the known world, in subjection to us. Why does it have to be any other way? Why does another nation have to come in? Why can't we so prepare ourselves to maintain world authority? Now, God had already declared himself, and a man is a fool to fight God. A man is a fool to try to change the plans of God. So, in chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar does something unusual. Let's go on in chapter 3. Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold. Why of gold? Well, Daniel had told him in chapter 2, verse 38, Thou art this head of gold. He said, Nebuchadnezzar, you're not the whole image. You're just the head. One day the head will be lobbed off. It'll be replaced with the breast and arms of silver. Nebuchadnezzar, you're not going to run the show till Christ comes back again. There are other nations to overthrow you and then the next one to overthrow that one and to succeed you. But Nebuchadnezzar thought it didn't have to be that way. So he made an image, and he made it all of gold, the whole image. Now, whether this was all pure gold or gold inlay over wood, I do not know. It was a tremendous thing in size. It was about 90 feet tall. The size of it here is three score cubits. That would be 60 cubits. A cubit is approximately 18 inches, or as measured by men of old time, from the elbow or the middle of the arm where the bend is to the extremity of the middle finger, approximately 18 inches. That would be a cubit. So here then would be a great statue approximately 90 feet high, all of gold, possibly of wood overlaid in gold, I don't know, except that the whole thing was covered with gold if it was not pure gold. Why did he do this? Thou art the head of gold. If the head can be of gold, why not the whole image? If Babylon can rule for a season, why can't they rule indefinitely? Why do we have to be overthrown? What? Now, in order to bring the people to this point of subjection, he made a decree. Verse 2. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king, Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image 
which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Now, all of the people in his empire couldn't come. It would be impossible. So he had representatives, the leaders, to come. If Washington were to call for an important meeting, President Nixon could say, I want the governor of every state, I want the mayor of every city, I want every senator, every congressman. These would be representatives of the people. Or if Uthant was calling a special meeting of all the members of the United Nations, he could ask for the president or the king or the prime minister or the premier, whatever might happen, whoever it might happen to be, and request that they come. It was this type of a dedication. It could not possibly be for all of the people in the empire. Verse 3. Then the, now, mind, he didn't tell them the nature of the dedication. He didn't say anything about that. He simply said, I want you to come. Then the princes and the governors and captains, the judges, the treasurers, and so forth, they came and stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then, then, and Herod cried aloud. He said, To you, it's commanded, O people, you don't have a choice. This is not a choice. You're not going to the church of your choice. You're not picking the denomination of your choice. It is commanded, O people, nations and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down in what? He didn't tell him it was going to be a religious service. He never indicated that. He said, we're going to dedicate an image. But you see, the image represented him. It was all gold. Now he's going to bring the people in his empire in subjection to literally worship him. They don't know this. But the golden image represents Babylon. Babylon, in his mind, will continue. Now the interesting and informative, instructive thing about this chapter is the whole chapter has to do with worship. If you will carefully read chapter 3 and keep your ballpoint pen close at hand and mark every appearance of the word worship in this chapter, and you will find it not less than 11 times, you will see what is in the mind of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, I want you to observe. It was commanded in verse 4, and the command was not to be altered so that he said, in verse 6, Whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. You worship from now on as you are told to worship or you pay with your life. You refuse under penalty of death. You say, Brother Strauss, that's an awful hard saying. It is. Did you know that we're coming to that? Did you know that the world is slowly but surely moving to this? You see, when the stone came down from heaven to smite the image in the dream, the image was intact. The whole image was there when it was struck, telling us what? As we pointed out earlier, that when the times of the Gentiles run their course, we have a situation in the world different from anything that has ever occurred before. You will find it in verse 43 of chapter 2. Whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Now, there were two types of, of rule that were paramount back in the ancient empire. One was an autocratic rule, uh, the rule of an autocrat, that's a dictator, that was Nebuchadnezzar. The second was an oligarchic rule. To have an oligarchy means to be ruled by a few. And that when the Medo-Persian Empire came together, their problems necessitated that they couldn't have one dictator, they had two nations, so they had a few rulers. Then came the rule of imperialism under Rome. Now we have moved in today to what we call a democracy or the voice of the people. Nothing today can be settled in many parts of the world without the voice of the people. And if you don't give them their voice, you're going to get it anyhow. 
You're going to get it with guns. You're going to get it with fire. You're going to get it with destruction. You're going to get it with looting. You're going to get it with death. You're going to hear what people want to say. People are going to have their voice. So that today we have the mingling of the seeds of man. You have everything thrown into a common melting pot in the United Nations. You have leaders there who are imperialistic. You have dictators. You have representatives of countries with an oligarchic view. You have a democratic or countries with a democracy or a republic in the United Nations. So they're bringing in to the United Nations now the mingling of the seeds of men. Now this is what you have at the end of the image in Daniel 2. So that you have in Daniel 2 ten toes. You have in this last beast ten horns. What does this ten represent? What are these ten toes and ten horns representative of? Well, we've already pointed out from Revelation 13 and 17 in prophecies which are unfulfilled as of this morning that there will be in the last days of the times of the Gentiles a federation of ten kings. There will be a ten nation, call it an empire if you will. Now what will be the nature of this empire, this United States of Europe, the federated states of Europe? What will be the nature of it? It will be exactly the same as it was when it began. It will be overrun by Babylonianism. Babylonianism began in the, at the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 10. There it had its commencement. Now you will notice that there was an ecumenicity about ancient Babylonianism. They said, let us build us a tower whose top may reach to heaven. Now I know that there are Bible teachers who spiritualize that. But if you spiritualize the tower, you have to spiritualize the whole passage. Let's face the thing squarely. I'm sure in Genesis 10 they had no concept as to where heaven was, how far those stars were away. Did you when you were a little child? Of course not. You hadn't the faintest idea that they were millions of light years away. And I think they were earnestly, sincerely trying to make a tower whereby they could gather all the people for common worship because it was there at the Tower of Babel where God dispersed them and confused their languages. He broke up the ecumenicity at Babel. But Babylonianism continued. And it now shows itself again in ancient Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar, where he demands again that all the world worship according to his dictates. Now notice, when Babel commenced, it had a religious aspect. They were seeking to build a tower whose top would reach to heaven. When it continued in Nebuchadnezzar's day, it had religious significance. Now when you come to the feet of the image, and when you come to the two horns of the to pursue it long enough and sincerely enough and prayerfully to discover that the Bible interprets the Bible. We men write books to explain the Bible, but in the final analysis, the Bible throws a lot of light on the books that we fellas write. We just have to face up to this. The Bible is a self-interpreted book, but some of us are called to do this. You are called to be a businessman, a professional man, a doctor, a dentist, or a lawyer. That's your calling. My calling is to spend my life in the study and teaching of the Bible. And so I think God has men around in various fields for that purpose. We try not to go astray in our interpretation. I believe that we have in Revelation chapter 13 a picture of the Antichrist who makes his appearance after the church has been caught out from the earth and taken to heaven. I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns. Now, when you have a crown, you have a king or a queen and a kingdom. And upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, his feet were as the feet of a bear, his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon, the dragon, gave him his power, and his seat, or the word seat is throne, and his authority. Where did he get his power? Where did he get his authority? He got it from the dragon. Who is the dragon? 
back up one chapter, 12 and verse 9, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. Who is this beast who arises at the beginning of the tribulation period, the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy, as we shall study when we come to chapter 9? Who is he? He's the little horn of Daniel 7. He is the Antichrist, the lawless one. Where does he get his power? He gets it from the devil. And the beast, and verse 3, And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world, all the world, yeah, you see the ecumenicity of the last days? That's the way it was in the Babylonian kingdom. All the world wondered after the beast, and they worshipped the dragon. Now, Revelation 13 contains the same point that Daniel chapter 2, or John, Daniel chapter 3 contains. It's the point of worship. So again, if you will take 13th of Revelation, your ballpoint pen, read it through, mark every appearance of the word worship, you will see the parallel between the two chapters. Verse 4, they worship the dragon. Now, this isn't fulfilled as of this morning. This is future. This is the great ecumenical church in the making in Revelation 13. It is in the process now. It's in its developing stages. It hasn't reached its finality, its fruition yet, but it's coming. It's coming. We're coming to Babylonianism. I will prove this from the Bible in a moment. This is not Lehman Strauss's opinion. Just hold on for a few more moments. Now, notice... Again, in verse 8, the ecumenicity of this. In Nebuchadnezzar's day, the known world was commanded to worship his image. He is a type, a forerunner of the Antichrist. Verse 8. And all, all, not some, not many, not most, but all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Now you say, what about the people who refuse? Of course, we Christians won't be here. We'll be in heaven when this is fulfilled. But what about those who refuse? Verse 15. He had power to give life unto the image of the beast. Someone asked me recently, does the devil have power to produce life? Well, there it is in verse 15. He had power to give life, of course, only with the permissive will of God. The devil has supernatural power. Read the first chapter of the book of Job. The devil has control over the elements. He can send a, a cyclone, a hurricane, a tornado. Read Job 1. Very clear. But only as God will permit him. And he said he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be what, class? Killed. You see, you're having in the last days what you had in the days of the Babylonian Empire. Now, what is this great world religion called today? It is known to us as the ecumenical movement. It consists of all the religions of the world. It began with the late Pope John. It began to be popularized, I should say. It's been in the plan of God long before we ever appeared on the scene. But it was popularized by the late Pope John. Now it has engulfed any religion that is willing to come in. The World Council of Churches has now agreed to accept the Pope and any Roman Catholic organization as a part of the World Council of Churches, which at one time was a World Council of Protestant Churches. Now the door is wide open for all religions to come into a common organization. And listen, all the Protestants need is an invitation from Pope Paul and they will join officially the ecumenical church. You say, Brother Strauss, will they get it? Just as surely as you're in this tabernacle, they will get it. It will come to pass. It will come to pass. So you have here worship by force. Did you know that we are coming to a day when people in the world, thank God we Christians won't be here then, we're coming to a day when the people in the world will be forced to worship the way they're told to worship. You say, is there any other scripture to bear this out? Lots of scripture. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're coming back to Revelation, so don't lose your place in there. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul, 
speaks of the day after the church has been taken away and the little horn has been manifested in the earth. By the way, two weeks ago, someone started a rumor through the camp, sincerely so. Uh, they had heard this from someone they thought knew what they were talking about, that John Fitzgerald Kennedy, uh, the late President Kennedy, would be the Antichrist. This is going around. This is not, this is not funny. This is serious. Now, of course, he can't be the Antichrist for one reason, that the Antichrist is going to be a Jew. So you can just settle now that John Fitzgerald Kennedy won't be the Antichrist. And the Bible makes that much very clear. We're not going to pinpoint who he is. I know, but I'm not going to tell you. Second uh, <laughs> Thessalonians chapter 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not, so, be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled. Don't let people throw you for a mental loop. Neither by spirit, people say they got this from the Holy Spirit, nor by word, if they taught it to you, nor by letter as from us. It's a forgery. If you ever got a letter with my name on, says Paul, it's a forgery. It never came from me. Um, that the day, not the day of Christ, the, the day of the Lord, the revised version gives us the correct rendering on this, the day of the Lord is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, that's the day of God's judgment, the pouring out of God's wrath, that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin, that's the man of lawlessness, that's the little horn, the Antichrist, be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He pulls the wool over the eyes of the Jews. He sells them a bill of goods. He tells them that he is their Messiah. And he really takes over the temple in Jerusalem and claims to be God. You see what we're coming to? You see what the ecumenical church is going to end up with? A man who claims to be God. Now, what does God call this system? You will find it clearly named in Revelation 17. Turn to this, and this will really shake you up a little bit. Revelation chapter 17. There came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Now, there are four significant women in the Revelation. There is Jezebel, chapter 2, the woman clothed with the sun in chapter 12, the bride, the lamb's wife in chapter 19, and a whore or a harlot in chapter 17. Now, I have read 48 commentaries on the book of the Revelation. I fought and studied over a period of 25 years in preparing to write my own commentary, and I am qualified to tell you that 95% of evangelical believers are agreed that Jezebel represents pagan idolatry, a system of worship, the woman clothed with the sun in chapter 12, and you can't miss that, you don't have to have a college degree, is, is Israel, a system of worship, the bride, the lamb's wife in chapter 19 is a system of worship, and I submit to you for your consideration that a consistent interpretation of the book will call for the fourth woman likewise representing a system of worship. So if Jezebel in chapter 2 and the woman clothed with the sun in chapter 12 and the bride the lamb's wife in chapter 19 are systems of worship, so is the whore or the harlot in Revelation 17. Now what does she do? She commits fornication with the kings of the earth, verse 2. Not a literal act of adultery or fornication. No woman goes to bed with all of the kings and all of the prime ministers and all of the premiers and all of the presidents of the world. That is not here. This is a spiritual fornication. This is a religious system. You'll find this as you study the four women of the apocalypse. So this is spiritual fornication. Here is a great religious organization that is now infiltrating the political empires of the world. 
and beginning to show her strength politically, militarily, financially. She's committing fornication with the kings of the earth. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So, writes John, he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-covered beast. This woman rises to the place of authority. She is in the saddle. Since we don't ride horses much anymore, except for exercise and sport and recreation, may I say she's in the driver's seat. That's what that means when it says here that she's sitting upon the scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads. And how many horns? Ten horns. Ten horns. Would you just turn over to verse 12? The ten horns which thou sawest are what class? Ten kings. Who is ruling over these ten kings? This woman. This great religious system. Now watch the description. Verse 4. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Can you think of any religion? That's taking the world. You have to be a scholar. Huh? Look at the next description. Having a golden cup in her hand. Full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Would you like to see her identification? Verse 5. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon, Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Babylon? That, you say, and this is still unfulfilled as of today? That's right. The point I'm making is that when the stone strikes the image, the whole image was standing. So you have today in the world the same thing that Nebuchadnezzar said. Why do I have to let go? Why can't I rule the world? Rome today says we will rule the world. We will rule the world politically. We will rule the world religiously. We will rule the world financially. And we're moving toward a great world church. You say, can this be strengthened by the chapter? No question about it. No question about it. If you will notice verse 1, it says that this great whore is sitting upon many waters. Do you see that? Now, do you want to know what that means? Don't look up to me for the answer. But look in verse 15, and the verse will tell you what it means. He saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples, multitudes, nations, tongues, or languages. Do you see the ecumenicity of that? You see, the whole world is under the rule of this harlot, this great religious system. Babylonianism has never died out. Romanism has never died out. The image is standing erect when the stone strikes. Why? You have the mingling of the seeds of men. Now, let me prove to you that Romanism has never died out. While the imperialistic empire of Rome disintegrated from within. It was never overthrown by a fifth world empire. Do you know why? Because the prophecy in chapter 7 and the prophecy in Daniel 2 would not allow for it. How then would Rome come to naught? She disintegrated from within. There couldn't be a fifth nation rule the world because the prophecy wouldn't allow it. So Rome had to collapse from within, which is exactly what happened. But Rome has never completely disappeared. From the smolderings of the old Roman Empire, there has arisen a system which is known as Romanism. It really introduces itself as a religion, but it's more than a religion. It's a political religious system, influencing great world leaders today. Who will move? We come close to the end when Russia will send her emissaries to the Vatican. That's really stretching the point. And that's what has happened as of the year of 1967. Russia now 
will visit the Vatican to ask a man who is called, God help us, never to be guilty of such blasphemy, a man who calls himself the Holy Father. The Bible says, call no man Father. One is your Father, even God. And when the world bows at the feet of a man and says, He is my Holy Father, I said the world, and we're coming to it fast today. When the world has bowed, watch the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Federated States of Europe, the United States of Europe, the Ten-Toed Federation, the Ten-Horned Federation, the Ten Kings of Revelation, listen to me, listen to me, will be influenced by the Vatican more than any other influence in the world, just as surely as you're sitting here. You say, is it in the making? We have possibly seven countries today. And the dethronement of de Gaulle might be a step toward the end. For a long time, I have felt that there was an operation needed in Europe. Somebody needed to remove de Gaulle stone. And, uh, But you see, he removed himself. Why? There's a God in heaven who is ruling over the affairs of men. And I see the possibility of the alignment of the nations, perhaps much quicker now. And I'm not making any predictions. The Lord may not come in my lifetime. But I'll give you something from my heart and my head, and I've arrived at it from the study of the Bible. I expect to be alive when he comes. Now, he might not. Don't you go out of here and say that Layman Strauss said, Jesus is coming before he dies. I didn't say that. I did not say that. I expect to be alive. I believe we are that close to the end. Did you ever wonder why another great world empire didn't overthrow the Roman Empire? Has that ever entered your mind? Why did she disintegrate from within? We're well on the way. We're well on the way to the same moral and spiritual disintegration. What is our hope? In the empires of men? No, men boast in their progress. They boast in their prowess. We got to the moon. Look what we did! What are we doing? Why, we're destroying one another. We need not an autocratic rule, not an oligarchic rule, not a democratic rule. We need a theocratic rule, the rule of God in the earth. And when Jesus comes, he'll set the world aright. Do you believe that? Look up. The future is bright with prospect. Let us pray. Loving Father, as we have seen unfolded in these clear prophecies of thy word, the future of the nations, who are but awaiting an outpouring of divine judgment and do not know it, we pray that we who make up the church will be about the business of the head of this church even the Lord Jesus Christ. We bow to call Thee our Holy Father. And blessed Savior, we bow to acknowledge Thy Lordship and Thy right to tell us what to do. There is one rebellious, stubborn heart that has been resisting Thee. Our prayer is, O God, that Thou will draw that one to Thyself this day. May there be victories won in heart, souls saved, this very day, 